Welcome everyone. My name is Ruby Barraza. My pronouns are she, her, hers, Aya. I am a domestic violence response coordinator here at the coalition. Um, and today's webinar is all about reducing intake trauma. Now, um, I'd like to preface this webinar by just getting the elephant, calling out the elephant in the room um, by saying that intakes are often a hot button subject for lots of programs. And we get that. Um, a lot of us here at the coalition come from working from programs. We have direct service experience. I myself worked at a shelter prior to coming to the coalition. Um, so I know what intakes are all about and I know they can be um, difficult. I know they can be, you know, an organizational challenge to get on the same page uh, in terms of like what funders are needing, what content needs to go in them, what questions we really should be asking. So the whole intent behind this webinar is to kind of get everyone on the same page in terms of um, ways intakes can be re-traumatizing and how we can go about mitigating some of that. So um, I like to start with some of our pictures here. So if you don't know who we are, you kind of get a face to the name. So we have Dory Nicholas, um, who is my direct su supervisor. She's the domestic violence response manager here at the coalition. Sam and myself, we are domestic violence response coordinators. Thank you, Sam, again, for being on the chat. And I also, whoops, um, need to shout out our wonderful sexual violence response department, Lindsay, Victoria, and Lachey all also uh, collaborated with us on developing this PowerPoint. So I can't, um, you know, fail to mention them either. They were really, really helpful for this too. So that's who we are. Um, let's talk about objectives. So first we wanna explore the where and the why intakes take place will recognize ways trauma impacts intake practices in our programs, and will finally describe qualities of an ideal intake practice um, and kind of what the ideal intake process, I guess, um, should be, okay? So first let's talk about what the heck is even an intake, just to get us on the same page um, and to get some kind of common language behind an intake. We might have different words for this, um, but let's just cover kind of how we're conceptualizing this. So one way we can define intake is very, very basic, right? It's really the action of taking something in. Now this just means, right, when we're working with a survivor, um, we're taking in their story oftentimes, right? Their experience with violence, um, their victimization, um, and what their priorities, challenges, and successes are. Now more kind of specific definition is we could call an intake the process of meeting a survivor, a client or a patient, often for the first time with the purpose of getting to know them and understanding their priorities. Okay. And intakes usually occur after a person has already been found eligible for services. So this just means that screening has already taken place. Um, and I just wanted to distinguish that, that screening and intake are different. Um, and for the purpose of this webinar, we'll be talking about intakes only and specifically. So where do intakes happen? Um, well, we know intakes are context dependent. So a lot of us mentioned, right, there's different ways you can be doing an intake, different settings, um, different contexts that perhaps you could do an intake. For instance, uh, you might be an advocate doing an intake with a new resident at a shelter. Maybe you're an advocate doing an intake with a sexual assault survivor at a sexual assault program or a family advocacy center. So for those of you who are outside of Arizona, um, Arizona has family advocacy centers um, where you know, a medical forensic exams um, usually take place. Maybe you're a court advocate doing an intake with an adult survivor involved in a court proceeding or you're a group facilitator conducting an intake with a survivor attending a support group. Maybe you are a youth advocate speaking with a child who's entered shelter with their parent. Or an advocate conducting an intake with a parent on behalf of a child victim. Maybe you're doing an intake with a survivor for a transitional or permanent housing program. Or your mobile advocate doing an intake for a survivor on the phone or virtually, maybe through Zoom or through FaceTime, things like that, which I know is become more and more common now um, due to the current events of our world. 
Um, so why should we do an intake? Um, so when we ask this question, usually we get these responses, right? Well, the purpose of an intake is for grants. Uh, well, it's just because our, it's our organizational policy. It's just what we do. It's how we were trained. Well, I need to do an intake to assign the person a bed, right, for shelter. Well, I need to do an intake to get more details about their victimization. Or I need to make sure that what happened to this person is really abuse or it was a really an assault. Well, I think it's just because it's part of my job, right? Well, actually, no. <laughs> the purpose of an intake shouldn't be for these reasons. Now, um, some of these, right, specifically when I'm talking about grants, we'll talk about grants in a minute, but some of these are completely valid. Um, but I really wanted to focus and kind of come back to what the purpose, the true purpose of an intake is. And the true um, purpose, right, the intake process, and I love this quote from the Sexual Assault Demonstration Initiative. Um, a lot of their work, I kind of grab bits and pieces uh, for this webinar. But they said that the intake process is about getting to know the whole person, not just their victimization, and helping them get reconnected to their wholeness, right? That should be the purpose, is to get to know who's in front of you um, and hopefully start them off um, in their healing journey somehow. Um, our interactions with them might be brief. Um, they might be in our program for a few days and then move on to their next journey. Um, but it's about getting to know that person who's in front of us and not just collecting numbers and data uh, for your own purposes. Now, sometimes we get asked to, well, why do we need all this information, right? Intakes can be very long. They may have a lot of questions that need to be asked, um, you know, fields that need to be entered and data that needs to be reported. Well, why do we need all of it? Let's ask ourselves that. And uh, Memory, who's a wonderful advocate here in Phoenix, um, was kind enough to share her experience with the intake process. And I wanted to pull this quote from her. She said that the intake is more than just putting survivors information in our database and, um, and another tally to the total for the report. It's someone's story of their very worst day of their life. That can't be understated or ignored. It's also the day a survivor comes to us to help them heal and either get safe or find support in a seemingly unnavigable system, which I loved. Now, we can't forget, right, when we're talking about issues of gender-based violence, um, systemic issues, and the power that many organizations hold, um, we have to talk and be very frank about these power dynamics. Um, and it's a really a requirement on us if we're doing this work to analyze the ways we hold and use power every single day. And if we don't do this, if we're not constantly analyzing, it's not a practice that we're engaging in, we risk taking part in these problematic power dynamics and replicating controlling behavior that survivors are trying to escape, right? That's what they're fleeing from. We don't want to recreate that in, in our systems. But we have to be you know, transparent and honest that the intake process is an inherently unequal, right? There's an inherent power imbalance. Uh, someone is coming for you for services, right? You hold that power, you're, you're at the giving end, right? You, you wield that power in being able to give someone what they need. Um, and that survivor is asking for something, right? So there's that imbalance there. So how can we aim to restore a survivor's power during, during this process? And hopefully through this webinar, we can find ways where we can, we can do that, right? And that should be the goal um, because survivor's power has been taken away, right? They've experienced a violation. Um, their bodies have been violated. Their boundaries have been violated. Their uh, autonomy has been violated. So how do we aim to restore that, right? We don't want to recreate that, those, those same dynamics. Okay, so I talked earlier about how intakes often have and often do uh, re-traumatize uh, survivors. Uh, and we don't want that to happen, right? We don't want our services to ever be re-traumatizing. Um, but we have to be honest about, well, if we're asking very personal questions, 
um, or the environments in which we're asking these questions or, or who, how, you know, our tone of voice and our body language is doing the talking, um, that can, you know, that can be a potential effect of, of an intake. So for this section, we're going to touch briefly on some trauma and kind of some basic trauma knowledge just to get us on the same page and remind ourselves of these very real uh, effects that trauma has on people. So surviving trauma, um, we know that traumatic stress involves a threat to emotional, physical, or sexual safety that results in feelings of either intense fear, loss of control, and helplessness. And a traumatic event often overwhelms a person's ability to cope. Trauma also interferes with our relationships, our memory, how we remember events, and our emotions. People are changed by trauma. And for those who are, um, are familiar perhaps with the ways trauma impacts the brain and body, we know that this happens, um, but our brains do change. Um, when there is a traumatic event that has happened to us, uh, our bodies and our brains do adapt um, to help us survive that event and it changes us. And no two survivors will respond to the traumatic experience of violence in the same way. So Sam and, Sam and I are here in the office and let's say a tornado just blew through, her and I would experience that event very, very differently, right? It wouldn't be identical. Even though we experience the same event, we're different people. So our coping styles, our family histories, the way we respond to trauma is going to be different. And being trauma-informed means recognizing that many behaviors and responses expressed by survivors are directly related to those traumatic experiences, meaning that it's not personal, right? If they get defensive, if they get emotional or overwhelmed, um, if they, you know, cop an attitude some days or they seem like they're not cooperating with you, it's not personal, okay? It's directly de related to some of the horrible things that they've gone through. Of course, I have to credit um, Dr. Herman here, who is fabulous, and she talks about trauma in her book, Trauma and Recovery. She's very instrumental in the trauma field. Um, I encourage you all to check her out if you haven't already. All right, so we covered kind of trauma basics, just to get us on the same page and remind ourselves, right, the impact that trauma can have. So let's tie it back to intakes. How can intakes then be re-traumatizing? Well, we know the, the fact that sometimes we have to write this stuff down, recording it, you know, uh, putting it in a file somewhere can be very overwhelming for someone. Might, that might not be something they want um, or, you know, have you do. But feelings of hesitation or suspicion are very normal, right? If someone is in a brand new environment, um, getting asked questions by a complete stranger and throw in there, right, that they've just experienced something traumatic, they're going to feel very skeptical, suspicious, overwhelmed, nervous. Um, it just makes sense. But this shouldn't be interpreted, right, by us as a lack of cooperation or them being dishonest or trying to, you know, uh, play the system, so to speak. And asking detailed questions about personal or sensitive information can feel really intrusive. I mean, think about it. When's the last time you went to, you know, uh, your primary care physician or, you know, medical professional and they ask some of these very, very personal questions? It can be very uncomfortable for some of us, even, even us as advocates. So a survivor might feel scared or ashamed about revealing this personal information. Um, they might have been threatened by a partner or the person that has harmed them that if they revealed some of these things, um, that something bad would happen. So keep that in mind, too. Um, so as advocates, I think it's really, really important and we should always aim to acknowledge how difficult it is, right? And that there might be a risk involved with sharing and that they certainly don't have to write everything down. So we should always, always, always remind that person they are under no obligation to share something they don't want to. Going back to our power discussion, right? Um, us, even just the, the fact that we're asking a question, might imply, right, that they need to answer that. So always being very clear at the very beginning of your intake, um, you know, I have a series of questions I'm gonna ask you, but you are under no obligation to answer any of them if you don't feel comfortable. 
um, and being very clear and repeating that as, as needed throughout the intake process. So here's some other things. Um, we wanted to share some kind of ideas or statements that you could share with someone who, who might be hesitant, who might feel a little uh, withdrawn or not too forthcoming. Um, and we wanna give you that language so you're better equipped um, should this happen in the future. So you can say things like, I'll only write down what you want. Right? Part of this is for grant reporting, right? Some of these questions are needed for that but you don't have to answer anything you don't want to. And reminding them, right, this information is yours. It belongs to you. At any point, you, you can request to see it, review it, or make edits. That should be a standard practice. Or you will always have the chance to look over any forms and make changes if anything I've recorded is incorrect or inaccurate, right, giving back that power to them. You can say things like, well, I certainly don't have to write it down. The purpose of me writing it down is for a couple reasons, right? It's important for me to, that I make sure I'm doing all that I can to support you and this serves as a tool so I can best do that. Also, our organization is primarily funded through grants that require us to ask, uh, certain inform ask, us, you know, ask you this certain information to make sure that we are held accountable in doing our jobs. However, if you don't want me to write down certain things, I certainly don't have to. And the time we spend together is about what you need, not what I need, okay? You can also say things like, well, we keep this information confidential and we don't share it with anyone without your permission, except in very specific circumstances. You decide what and how much to share and my job is to protect what you share, protect that information. Now, we also have to consider, right, the, the ways that trauma impacts our emotions. Um, being really aware of our environmental space, right, does it convey safety? And we'll talk about that in the next slide. Um, it might be very wise, too, to give a survivor a comprehensive tour of your facility, if, especially if you are doing it in maybe a residential setting or even in your office space, right, if you're at a community-based program or maybe you're in an integrated kind of uh, you know, multidisciplinary style um, building, it might be cool to do that um, because it reduces anxiety, right, or fear about being in a new space. Sometimes this is the first time a survivor has entered a program at all, right, in their life. So it might be a really, really good idea to, to give them a tour, right, these are where the bathrooms are, this is the drinking fountain, you know, vending machine if you want a snack, um, here's our coffee maker, um, you know, and this is the space where we'll be doing our intake here. Um, we'll talk about kids in a minute, but, you know, having activities for kids is also a good idea. Also being aware, right? Are you constantly being interrupted by others um, or are you in a noisy environment? Okay. Those might be things we have to address um, before starting the intake because I don't know about you, but I've been in situations where I've you know, had to have a very serious conversation with someone and we just keep getting interrupted, right? Phones going off, people coming in and out, um, there's noise outdoors, uh, and it's really, really um, frustrating for me, right, who's trying to have this serious conversation. So it can be really, really distracting. And always remember, again, like I mentioned earlier, that this may be someone's first time in their life receiving advocacy services. So first impressions are really, really important um, and we wanna make sure we give a good one. All right, so earlier I talked about our environment, right? Does our environment convey safety? So it's important we assess our environment um, and the spaces in which we're doing intakes. Um, so keep in mind, this is just a, you know, a general kind of idea um, certainly doesn't apply to every survivor, but people who are traumatized may rarely sit with their backs to the door. So check out your, you know, office space or where you're conducting intakes and be mindful, right? If you are sitting or having the survivor sit in a, in a corner or without access to leaving really quickly, that might be very, very uncomfortable for them. Um, and they might be experiencing some um, or being becoming dysregulated as a result. So always provide a way out by not blocking the door. And I would always, I would, you know, 
add to this that you give them the choice, right? How do you feel most comfortable in this space? Do you want to close the door? Do you want to open it? Um, do you want to have it just cracked open? Um, and letting them be kind of in control of that environment is, is how I would go about it. Ask the survivor what would make them comfortable, right? Do you need a drink of water? Do you, would you like some coffee? Um, you know, when's the last time you ate? Do you want some snacks? Or do you, are your kids hungry, perhaps? Um, or do you need like a, a coloring page so you can doodle, right? And get some of that nervous energy out. Maybe you need to draw the, the curtains or the blinds, right? Or maybe you need to open them. Again, giving that choice back to that survivor. Maybe again, you need to rearrange your seating. So again, you know, being mindful of your exits and the doors, um, they might not want to sit with their backs behind the door. So you have to rearrange your seating somehow and be being flexible enough to do that. Maybe you need to provide sensory fidgets. So I mentioned earlier, sometimes we come with a lot of nervous energy. So having like coloring pages or Play-Doh, something tactile that they can do with their hands uh, is also a good idea. Uh, and maybe too, um, you know, I don't know how many of you do intakes on the computer. Um, so this might be a difficult one to mitigate, but if you are doing paper intakes, um, maybe you can do it uh, away from your desk or away from your computer, right? If there's like a barrier in between you and the survivor, um, that can communicate, right? That there's this distance or, you know, I, I am in a position of more power than you. Um, and maybe we don't want to recreate that. So you can be flexible in doing the intakes in a, in maybe their, their um, bed area, um, in a lobby, somewhere private or comforting, um, depending on, on your office or your program. Now, um, you know, when we talk specifically about the questions we're asking, we know that can trigger a lot of emotion out of people. Um, a lot of questions and, you know, confusion maybe about the questions being asked. Um, and we know that just like you and I, right, we all have emotions that come from a combination of love, affection, familial obligations or family histories, cultural values or religious beliefs. And survivors may still care or love the person who has harmed them, but they want the abuse to stop. Um, or they can be just experiencing very complex emotions about their experience, right? The abuse or the assault that they endured. So an effective advocate will be open to these kinds of feelings and validate those without judging them. And being open, right? Being open with our survivors and being transparent, being very validating creates an emotionally safe space, right? Back to our environment, um, we can't ignore, right? Or neglect our emotional safety in these spaces. Um, and that emotional safety uh, opens up the opportunity for them to explore their experiences and the impact it's had on their lives. All right, so I mentioned earlier um, how kids might be a component, right? You know, survivors rarely um, leave their kids with others. Um, usually they tend to bring them with them to services or to you know the intake process. Um, you might have maybe um, have set a boundary with that person earlier. Maybe you called them before they came in and said, you know, unfortunately we don't provide childcare. Um, if you can, you know, uh, coordinate childcare with someone in your life that you trust before coming in. So maybe that's a practice that you have. Other programs might be very flexible, right? And I encourage you all to be flexible when it comes to children. Um, we know childcare costs can be, can be a very serious barriers, uh, not only for survivors, but most people in the world, um, in our society. But it's important we be conscious of the ways children need to be included in services, um, and we can't forget them either. So we're talking about young kids. Um, young children might be scared. They might be very clingy to their parent and refuse to leave them, okay? So are we being harsh or are we being too strict by saying, you know, kids can't be in the room. Kids can't be part of the intake process. We have to be flexible, right? Young kids can be traumatized too. And often those uh, responses to trauma look very different than adults. Um, so we have to be compassionate and understanding. Um, 
So one thing you could do, right, you can show children and youth where the, their parent will be located while you conduct the intake and vice versa. So if you, if you are an advocate who prefers to do intakes alone with the adult survivor, um, but they brought their kids with them, um, you know, how, how can we ensure that child care is provided for, right? So you're able to do your, your, your intake effectively. Um, so maybe you, you know, you get the help of a fellow advocate who can play with the kids for, you know, an hour or so or um, provide board games and activities for them to do, but always being clear about, you know, mom's going to be over here. Um, you know, we can leave the door open if you want, um, but um, being flexible in that way is important. Also, be mindful and really adjust your expectations. Um, be you know, we have to understand that it's it's going to be normal and common for kids and youth to interrupt you, okay? So expect those interruptions. Um, kids might feel very scared and clingy, so not having their parent by them, um, they're going to want to interrupt. They're going to want to see where mom and dad or mom or dad is, gonna, is in your office. Um, back to the importance of having support in your organization. So having support if an individual has many children. So you might be working with a survivor who has multiple kids of all ages. Um, so it's important you kind of employ the, the support of another advocate or another staff member um, to help support that. Always have toys, games, activities available. You might not be a youth advocate. You might not be a child therapist or a child advocate, um, but it's important that you consider, right, that your survivors have kids. So by extension, right, you should be uh, um, open to and at least uh, consider the fact that you also have to meet the, the needs of these children too. Uh, give the parent choice in having the children present for the intake process. Um, so again, a, a parent might not want their kids being taken care of by a stranger or to be placed in a different room, right? Depending on their, their experience, they might not have that trust established yet, right? That's okay, that's totally reasonable. So if that parent is very adamant that no, I want my kids with me, great, be flexible in that too. Um, so maybe, right, this might not be the best time if the children are present. Um, to ask such personal questions. So it, you, maybe you can take that opportunity when they're asleep or they're at school to ask some of the, the more deep questions that you need to ask. And if you've ever been to one of my, you know, domestic violence and children uh, presentations or trainings, you know, and this is a um, soapbox that I can get on, but it's really, really important that all domestic violence programs and all sexual assault programs too, consider incorporating children's orientations or youth orientations into your programs, right? Especially if you're a residential program or you're providing services for adult survivors. Uh, we know adult survivors have children too, okay? And if we can um, meet the needs of those kids and at least get them oriented to the program, giving them a tour, giving them kind of what to expect, um, then we're, we're doing them and that family a big, big service. So I mentioned earlier when we talked about trauma, the trauma and uh, memory, right? Memory is impacted by trauma. Um, so this poses a big um, problem, right? If we're talking about intakes and we're asking about uh, their previous experiences, maybe they have to recall some information. So let's talk about that. We know that pe people experiencing trauma don't always remember events in a linear chronological order, right? That's just some brain science there. Uh, we won't get into too specifics, but we know that uh, memory is, is deeply impacted by trauma. So this might present, right? Survivors might present as scatterbrained, forgetful, maybe not focused or distracted. Survivors might struggle to recall even information that might seem impossible to forget, like their own child's state of birth, or maybe their social security number, or even, you know, like the last, um, their phone number perhaps, or their email address. Be careful not to judge that survivor or assume that they, you know, must be lying or making up something if those details change or they can't remember something, 
again, right, trauma impacts people very, very differently. Um, and it might be very common, right, that they uh, say one thing and then take it back or they um, remember, you know, oh, uh, it wasn't like that or they remember different details. Um, always remember that's, that's one of the effects of trauma. Um, and two, it might be really overwhelming if you have a laundry list, right, of all these things that you're sharing with them, policies, procedures, uh, when you do your laundry, you know, the, the food that you can cook in the kitchen, kind of, um, um, you know, the, the chores maybe in your area, in your shelter, they might not be able to retain all the, that information. It's information overload sometimes. So they might not remember all this stuff discussed at intake, but uh, developing printed materials, like giving them an intake packet or like an orientation booklet can help mitigate this so they can take this with them, read it, you know, at their own time, at their own pace and make sure they grasp that information. Um, also, it's important that they get written information about your program, um, not only to, you know, for trauma and memory sake, um, but in the future, right, if they um, have a question or need to know what their rights are in your program, they have something physical that they can reference. Always, always validate, you know, if they seem you know, forgetful or, you know, they're distracted easily, help them see this as a normal trauma response. And that's one of the, the services that we can provide as advocates is to validate, right, um, what they've gone through and the experiences that they've had um, and the, the impacts that these experiences had on their lives. Okay. So now let's transition to talking about ideal intake practices. And all of this I took from the Sexual Assault Demonstration Initiative, which is a fantastic resource. Um, I am actually willing, and they, they have it put together like a handout with these four ingredients that we're gonna discuss shortly. So if you're interested in receiving that handout, let me know and I can share it. Um, but it's really wonderful. It's a good quick tool to um, just know, right, what are the four kind of core ingredients that go into an ideal intake form. So the first ingredient is information you want the survivor to know, okay, and that can mean statements like, I believe you, right, I'm here to support you. Also be cl being clear about what the role and the boundaries of the advocate are, right, this is what I can do and this is stuff I can't do, okay. Also, off the bat, uh, in any intake, it's always, always important to um, start your, your intake process by disclosing your status as a mandatory reporter. And each state is very different. So um, become familiar with your duty to report policies and statutes in your state, but always being upfront about your status, right? Most advocates are mandatory reporters. So being clear, right? Whatever you share with me is confidential, except for if I suspect, you know, child abuse or you disclose that there's been child abuse or neglect, um, you know, or there you shared information that you want to hurt yourself or another person, you know, then that would break confidentiality. So there's different ways you can phrase that, but being very upfront um, and not waiting until the very, like the last second um, after someone has disclosed something, you're, you're, you're now like, oh, great, I have to make a call, right, or, or call our child welfare department. Um, also being clear about uh, what, uh, what agency services you provide. Um, so that can include like, hey, we have support, support groups on these days. Uh, we have a legal advocate that you can meet with. Um, we have employment services. So if you wanna to talk to like a job coach, if you wanna tidy up your resume, we have that service. Uh, we have children's groups. So, you know, listing off, you know, what they can expect from your program and what services you provide. Um, also how to schedule appointments and how to reach you. So um, this can mean, right, your phone number, right, how you are reachable, your email address, maybe you let them know, hey, I'm on call, you know, one week out of the month, and, you know, when I'm on call, you can reach me 24-7, um, but, you know, outside of that, you know, you can contact this number and another advocate might pick up, or, you know, I'm not an on-call advocate, so my, my, you know, schedule is Monday through Friday, you know, from eight to five, um, and that's when you can expect to see me and we can work together during, during those hours. 
second ingredient is having open-ended questions, right? This is kind of, uh, instead of having those closed-ended yes or no, true or false type questions, um, you it's more of a discussion, right? It's a conversation you're having. So you can say things like, how would you like for me to help you today? What would you like for me to refer to you as, right? What name are you comfortable with? What are your pronouns? And what would you like to share with me about your experiences with domestic or sexual violence? Or they might have used a totally different word. Um, you know, they might have called it an assault or, you know, violence or abuse. Um, and go with that, right? Use the language, mirror that language that the survivor is using. Uh, what supports do you have in your life, right? Who can you count on or what, what strengths do you come with already? What are your skills? And then obviously open, leaving it open to any questions they have. Um, did I share something that was unclear? Um, would you like me to go back and like explain something differently? Um, any question, no, no question is off limit, right? And making it very clear that this is their space and they can um, ask anything they want. And third question, third ingredient is required signatures. So here is where our, um, often our grants, well, I'll talk about grants in a minute, but um, here's where kind of our state statutes come in, where um, if we are a state funded or federally funded program, we might be obligated to collect certain signatures from our program participants. So thing, that might, again, be influenced by federal or state laws. Um, as well as our domestic violence state service standards. Now in Arizona, we only have domestic violence state, state service standards. Sally sells seash seashells by the seashore. Um, uh, but we're working on some sexual violence state service standards um, and we're very excited to have those finally. Um, so stay tuned. Um, just, and this is Arizona only. So if you're from another state, um, you might have both domestic and sexual violence uh, service standards already established, which is awesome. Um, so these things might look like, you know, if you have um, like a release of information, perhaps if you are doing an intake and through your conversation with the survivor, they say, you know, I really need you to talk to my uh, probation officer or my you know my therapist needs your contact information cool if that's something immediate that they need you can go ahead and you know have explain what a release of information is and have them sign it um, never ever ever should you have an open-ended release of information um, that is bad practice um, we can get in a lot of trouble right as programs uh, if we have that um, and you're not making it very clear, right, that, you know, what a release of information is. It should be time limited, it should be specific, um, and it should be what the survivor wants. Um, other things, it could include things like an emergency contact information, so maybe they need to share, you know, if that's part of your program policy is to have that information. Um, maybe you have a confidentiality agreement. Um, we know this is often the case if you're um, housing participants in a protected location, um, you know, that they agree not to share that location with others. Um, it could be liability forms, perhaps for your, for your uh, program. Um, you know, if there's children doing activities or things like that, you might need a signature from your parent. Um, so it just depends, and each program is going to be very different, but usually there's state laws that say, right, you need written consent or written information from a survivor. So B, go back to your programs and really understand what those uh, required signatures are. Now, finally, the fourth ingredient for an ideal intake form is the demographics, right? And this is where our grants come in. Now, this should never be the purpose, right, to working with a survivor or doing an intake. Um, this should be, and this is why it's the fourth one, because um, it should be last. Um, it shouldn't be our priority to collect data. Um, remember, uh, it's a chance to get to know the person. That, that should be our priority. So some demographic information that you can collect. Um, those things might be required by uh, federal and state laws or your funding requirements. So depending on your funder and whatever your contract says, you know, there might be some demographic information that you must report. And of course, the state service standards uh, that I mentioned earlier. So in Arizona, we have domestic violence uh, service standards. 
Uh, and those typically only include things like county information, age range, uh, gender information, what race or ethnicity the survivor is, what their income level is, the relationship status to their the person that caused them harm, the reason why they're seeking services, any children's information if applicable, and then other demographics. And I put this in quotes because it depends on, of course, the grant that's asking, but that can include things like their disability status, um, if their um, English is their second language, so their limited English proficiency, um, if they're an immigrant or refugee, if they're a rural survivor, a rural program. So it just depends. And I, again, I wanted to make this general enough um, that everyone can kind of get information and some tips. Um, so I encourage you all kind of leave you with some homework to go back and see what your funders require um, and only ask those questions. And to make this easy, um, you are all welcome. And this is public information if you want it. On our website, we have a link to the full service standards, domestic violence service standards. Um, so you're welcome to um, look at those and read those um, on your time, on your own time. But in the appendix, we actually have an aggregate data form and I have some screenshots here for you uh, with all of that information in there, right? And this is meant, this was designed to be a self, um, like a self report type form so you can hand this to a survivor and they decide right and they check off you know what applies to them um you know we have age range we have you know they can select an ethnicity or race income brackets or levels what their relationship status is um the reason for seeking services so you can kind of get an idea of what this form looks like um to help supplement right the the requirements of funders and again, all of this information is available on our website where you can download it and use this form if, if you'd like, um, or take a look at the appendix for more of those resources. All right, now I always like to survey um, real survivors, right? People who have lived through this stuff. Um, to see what they have to say um, and what their experience has been with intakes and the intake process. So at the coalition, we have our share committee, which is our survivor advisory council. Um, so it is a committee of survivors, both domestic and sexual violence survivors. Um, and I surveyed them and I said, you know, what has your experience been with intakes and what advice would you give a person doing intakes? And they said things like this to not make someone feel as though they're asking for the abuse. I would tell the person that this information helps me to help them. They're in a safe, non-judgmental zone, and I am here to be a resource to them, but I need to ask some personal questions to aid with that. And of course, inform them that by law, I would be required to report certain things. So again, be being very clear about your um, status as a mandatory reporter, like being very upfront with that, Consider the circumstances the person is there for. Imagine how they might feel if they were in that person's shoes. Ask about level of comfort and go slower. Understanding that as a crisis person, you too have to start the intake with a new person as a new person, leaving behind the previous interaction. If you've ever been to a training with Doreen, my supervisor, she likes to reference the Etch-a-Sketch. So, you know, reminding yourself, right, if you're doing an intake with a brand new person, it's like shaking an etch a sketch, right? It's clearing your previous interaction um, so you can be full and present for the next person. Have the questions be open-ended, ask about healthy coping or supportive people, add a statement of non-judgment or support, convey belief, it's really that simple. They had a lot, uh, a wealth of knowledge to share with me. And these were some, just some quotes that I pulled from their um, surveys. Um, and again, right, these are the experts and I felt it important that I should um, give, give you all their perspective too. All right, so we are closing up. I think this was a short webinar also, but I wanted to leave you all with this information. Um, 
it's very, very important that as programs, we train everyone, staff, volunteers, maintenance people, anyone really involved with working with a survivor who might be interfacing with a survivor at odd hours of the day, especially if we're a shelter program. We know shelter, um, survivors often come to us in the wee hours of the morning or very, very late at night. Um, so we have to make sure that everyone who's, who might be interacting with some with a survivor um, is trained on this stuff, right? Trained on trauma-informed intakes and also really encouraging that um, staff become familiar with the questions. Um, it should really be a practice where intakes are conversational, meaning that um, the person comes before, before the forms, right? It, it should never be, right, the form is more important than the person. It should always be the other way around, right? Where I'm listening to you, I'm giving you my undivided attention, I'm explaining what my role is and how I can best support you, but the forms are not my priority right now. Yes, I will have to complete them, um, but you are more important right now. And really communicating that and if we're glued to you know a clipboard and we're checking stuff off and we're hardly giving any eye contact or validation um, that communicates to that survivor that you know this piece of paper is more important than me always our questions should never be voyeuristic or data driven so back to this idea that um, you know the forms shouldn't be the priority um, really asking ourselves, what kind of questions are we asking people? Um, you know, if we're asking about their, you know, last period or, you know, the very specific gruesome details about their victimization, um, I really encourage you to reassess um, what purpose do those questions serve. And I would also encourage you all to be ready to defend the questions that you're asking. If you can't defend them, if you can't provide a justification or explain the purpose behind asking that question, maybe you shouldn't be asking it. The best intakes also are blended into conversation, going back to the idea, right, where the person comes first. So this might be a good homework task, or if you're a new advocate, or perhaps you're a supervisor who is um, tasked with training you know, new employees, this is a good uh, opportunity for new staff, new advocates to practice intakes, maybe role playing with another staff person, another coworker, um, and really getting to know the questions in and out, um, memorizing some of them if needed. That way, when you are working with the survivor, you have them already in your mind and you can kind of weave them into the conversation. Um, so when you go back to your forms later, after you've said goodbye, um, you can fill it out, right? You have that knowledge and information. And always remember that intakes are your chance to connect with a survivor. That is the goal, right? That's the purpose behind an intake is to connect. It should never be what the grant needs or I need to fill out this packet of information or it's just because it's my job and that's what I was trained to do. Um, this is my chance to meet with someone who due to unfortunate circumstances uh, needs our help and needs our services. And how can I best support that person? How do I get to know them? How do I build rapport? How do I build trust? Um, how do I return some of that power that they've lost? Um, and remember, this is often that first impression that we're giving. So if we're treating intakes as a chore or as you know something that we hate to do or something that takes too long, um, Survivors are going to feel that, and they're going to they're going to walk away feeling like, you know, a chore, like you just had to do this, or like um, you were forced to kind of get this over with. Um, so really reframing it as a chance for us to get to know the person who's who's you know keeping our doors open. And if you want to look at it that way, um, they're here because they need help, um, and we are open and funded because survivors need our help. So. Um, if anything, they're doing us a service um, by, by sharing their, their lives, their um, some very vulnerable moments in their life. Um, and that's a privilege, right? It's not, not everyone can do that. Not everyone has the chance to do that. Um, and to me, I've always looked at it as an honor, right? To, to have someone share some of their deepest, hardest lot, uh, parts of their lives um, with a complete stranger. So 
I will open this up for questions. If you have any, throw them in the chat box um, or down below. I am very accessible through email. So if you have a specific question, maybe you don't want to ask it here, you can always email me. But this wraps up our webinar. I hope it was informative. I hope you learned something.